Hello and welcome back to another video guys. Today we will be talking about how to remove unwanted objects from an image which for example could be like this where I removed people in the background from my picture. So this was the picture before and this is how it looked afterwards and here's another example of an input image and here's the result of it where I removed people in the background and I'm pretty sure you're here today to learn how to do it yourself and I can tell you it's super easy. You don't need any Photoshop skills or something. It took me like maybe sometimes a minute, sometimes five minutes, but it's super easy to apply those new AI models and get great results. And yeah, today I will show you how you can do it yourself. For this, we will use three different AI models which are able to remove people or objects in the background. And I know some of you will be interested in how those models actually work and what are their characteristics, while others are just here to, you know, get their results as fast as possible. They're not really interested in how those models work. For you, just skip to the hands-on inpainting part of the video because then you can skip all the theory. And for all of you, you're actually interested in how those models work and how it is possible for AI models to remove objects or people in the background. Stay with me because that's the first part of the video. And and then I will practically show you how to remove any objects, people from the background in your pictures so you get great results. And yes, let's start with the theory behind these AI models. What I referred earlier as removing objects or people from pictures is in research, it's called image inpainting. And this basically describes we have an input image and have a mask for a certain area. So that information is basically removed from that image and we want an AI model to inpaint these masks with realistic and plausible content. And as you may could imagine, this is a very challenging task because many options would be possible. I show you one example right here. And you know, what we can see here is that the street on, on the one hand side should be continued in the picture, but then we could technically have a car inside that picture, maybe a scooter driver, or just the street. So you can see many visual outputs will be reasonable and correct, which makes image inpainting a very difficult problem. What we saw earlier in that image is that to be able to inpaint certain masks in an image, our model must be able to understand visual structures and patterns throughout the whole image to be able to continue them in the mask. For example, in the image before, it would be to understand that there's like a street and we want the street to be continued in our mask and that our model must learn. And I don't know how familiar you are with CNNs, but usually like convolutional layers, if you stack them behind, you grow like in a linear way, a receptive field. But often CNNs are very good at extracting local features like corners or edges, for example, but they struggle with understanding long distance relationships in an image. And to better understand this, I show you an example where we stack multiple convolutional layers and can see how the receptive field grows. So basically the more convolutional layers we have stacked behind each other, the more information of the input image we can consider in the last layer. Okay, but why am I telling you all this? Now let's look at this small piece of the image that we saw earlier. It's just above the mask that we saw. And based on this, I guess you wouldn't have assumed that you should continue a road in, in the mask, but instead would draw something which looks like a forest or plants or trees, I don't know, something green. And this is basically the struggle if we have a like limited receptive field because our convolutional neural not network couldn't see like the whole context of the image and maybe we would draw wrong conclusions and wouldn't continue a street but rather draw a forest in, in the masked area. And this is why it's so important to have like global understanding of the image. To overcome this problem with a limited receptive field, the LAMA model, rather than applying convolutions to the spatial domain, which is like the pixel level, they apply, which is very smart, apply the convolutions to the spectral domain. They basically transform the input image, which is in the spatial domain with a Fourier transform into the spectral domain and apply then the convolutional uh, operation. And this is based on the spectral convolutional theorem, which states that a pointwise update in the spectral domain globally affects the spatial domain if we convert it. 
like it's always possible uh, to also inverse the Fourier transform back from the spectral domain to the spatial domain. And uh, what this in fact means is that we're able to achieve a global receptive field in our model architecture and hence we're able to understand global image patterns or understand the context of the image better using the LAMA model. I know that thinking of images in terms of frequencies or sine and cosine waves is not very intuitive for us humans, I would say, but I want to show you the following picture to give you a better understanding how any image can be described by an addition of many frequencies. Yeah, and in that image, on the left-hand side, we can see an image with a few uh, black vertical bars, <laughs> a little like my, my shirt today. And um, on the right-hand side, I used exactly the same image, but I added as a third dimension the pixel value, like on a monochrome level grayscale, so from 0 to 255. And there we can pretty good see that there is a wave underlying that image with the vertical bars, which is, in fact, before was not pretty obvious, but now that we have the third dimension and see the pixel values, it's pretty obvious that there is a wave or frequency underlying that image. And of course, this is a pretty simple scenario uh, that I showed you right now, but in fact, it's possible to reconstruct any real world image by just adding a lot of different frequencies. And in the spectral domain, this wave that we saw right now would be just one component. And this kind of shows this one component impacts the whole image because we see like all the vertical bars. And if we, for example, would take a, a different frequency with another wavelength, which would be different component, then we would have, for example, less or more vertical bars in that image. So we can see single components in the spectral domain impact the whole spatial domain. Let's summarize the LAMA model. Besides the fast Fourier convolutions, the authors of the model also introduced a perceptual loss that is based on a semantic segmentation network with a high receptive field. And also they introduced an aggressive training with very large mass. That's also uh, where the name is derived from. Lama actually means large mass. And yeah, this led to a model that is, from my perspective, really creates great or impressive results which I will show you later, of course. Since the LAMA model is a fully convolutional model, we are also able to pass the model images of various sizes. So it is not a fixed size image that's required by the model. However, the authors state that they trained the model with 256 times 256 times images. And they stated that, that using images with a higher resolution could lead to slightly worse results. And this is also one of the cons of the LAMA model that it achieves on common benchmarks for image and painting like compared to the other models that I will introduce in this video, the lowest scores. And still, when I use the LAMA model myself, one thing I really liked is it offers a fast inference, so you will get your results pretty quick. And the other thing is besides the benchmarks, I personally found that I was very happy with the results I got. And if I wasn't happy with the results of the LAMA model, then I used the other models, but more on that later in the practical section. As mentioned in the cons of the LAMA model, there are even models that produce better results than the LAMA model, and the MAT model is one of them. I would just call it MAT. I'm not sure if it's MAT model or MAT. I just stick to MAT, <laughs> MAT now. As I was talking earlier about receptive fields already, you might have thought about transformers. Why aren't we using transformers? Because they also allow for a global field. The LAMA model is a little bit older and back then transformers weren't as well established in the computer vision AI area than they are right now. But the MAT model yeah, uses transformers for exactly that reason, because they allow for a global receptive field. But since image inpainting is a little bit different than other computer vision tasks like uh, image classification or object detection, they made a few changes to the transformer block. That's definitely a thing we're going to look into. But at the start, I just want to give you a quick reminder how computer or like images and transformers, which are made actually for natural language translation, how they can work together. And uh, then we will look into the changes that the MAT model made to the transformer blocks. Okay, let's have a look at this illustration, which shows how we can merge the two worlds of images and transformers. So how can we convert 
an image to, an, to a sequence and for this we split it into several patches and each of those patches is then transformed to a single sequence like an embedding or think of this uh, transformation of the patch to a sequence like applying a filter or like a convolutional filter because the information is not lost it's just a different representation in a different space basically and once we have those sequences we can pass them to a transformer and build like these long distance and self-attention mechanisms with those individual sequences which are all parts of our image in the end. In practice of course there is a little bit more to this but this should help to get a broad understanding of how images can work with transformers together and yeah now let's look at the changes that were proposed by the MAT model. Similar to the LAMA model the MAT model also got trained on images with very large mass and I think one of the reasons is to really force the model during the training to learn semantical structures in the image because it gets so few real information it really has to rely on long distance uh, information co combining those and as I mentioned earlier in tasks like image classification and object detection we obviously want to use the whole image as a source of information while with this large massed areas we have plenty of sequences that are actually worthless or don't contain any information because they are masked. Yeah, and this has the consequence that most, or like a large portion of our tokens or sequences are useless because they don't contain any information. And the authors of the MAT model argue that changes to the transformer block or like the transformers architecture have to be done because while training their impending model, they faced unstable optimization which were like exploding gradients due to the many tokens that are actually worthless or don't contain information. And that's why they proposed several changes to the Transformers architecture and we will look into the two major ones. The first one is the adjusted transformer block and as we can see in the illustration, on the left hand side we have the conventional transformer block and on the right hand side we have the MAT in painting oriented transformer block. And the major difference that we can see here is first that the linear normalization is not anymore applied in the in-painting oriented transformer block. The authors justify this with the assumption that the linear normalization leads to the fact that the useless tokens are magnified by the linear normalization and hence lead to unstable optimization during the training. And because of that they just removed the linear normalization from the transformer block. The second difference that we can see in the illustration is that the residual connection got replaced by a fusion learning approach, which is a concatenation. So instead of element-wise adding uh, the output of the multi-head attention, we now concatenate those results with the input to the multi-head attention. And once again, they, the authors reason this with the fact that many tokens are useless, especially in the beginning, and argue that this step also helps to optimize the training or helps getting a stable optimization. The second major change introduced by the authors of the MAT model is the contextual attention. And what authors did there is introducing a dynamic mask M as follows. So we see the mathematical uh, definition here. And if you're familiar with attention, you can see that the dynamic mask M is added to the attention scores derived from the query metrics and the key metrics. And what, <laughs> what does this now mean for us? Basically, if the token J is valid, then the value in the mask is zero. So we actually don't change the attention equation at all. But if the token is invalid, then we subtract the attention score by minus tau. Tau is the, just a Greek letter that looks a little bit like an R. And um, the authors in the paper said that they used 100 for this. And what this actually means is like we get a very low attention score. And since we then apply softmax, we will have a value close to zero for, for exactly all the tokens that are invalid. And since we afterwards multiplied with a value matrix, which is like the uppercase V in the end of the quotient, this will end up to be that only tokens that are valid contribute with their values basically to the all overall attention metrics or attention vector and all the tokens that are useless or worthless uh, have literally like no contribution to, to the attention vector in the end. 
And there's one more thing. I said it's a dynamic mask and where's the dynamic coming from? This we can see in this picture. So the crosses in the illustration show invalid tokens while boxes that are not checked are valid tokens. And what we can see here and each update if in a window, a window is one orange rectangular, um, if there is at least one valid token inside, all the invalid tokens after the update also get valid. So in the step from A to B, we can see that one invalid tokens got valid. And then we do a shift. This is how the architecture actually works. So we, all, we, we only apply self-attention within those windows. So we don't have global attention at the very start of the model. But what, uh, since we shift over the course of multiple layers, our windows, we will eventually have a global attention or like a global receptive field at the end or like in deeper layers of our model. And if you want to learn more about this, I will link down below in the description this Wind Transformer paper, which actually introduced the idea of the shifting windows. But to summarize the idea, because especially with high resolution images, we get like so many tokens that applying the self-attention mechanism would require heavy computational cost um, by dividing those in windows and then um, shifting those windows and overall achieving a global attention with this, we have huge computational savings and this makes the model way more efficient. But back to the dynamic mask, what we can see overall in the image by repetitively updating our mask and shifting the windows, we like gradually distribute the over their entire image the information of the valid tokens and this also especially to the areas of the large mask uh, where basically no information at all is available at the very beginning. Now let's summarize the MAT model. By making some adjustments to the conventional transformer block, the authors of the MAT model were basically able to exploit the full potential of transformers in image inpainting and achieved state-of-the-art results in multiple inpainting ben benchmarks, which is really impressive and really cool. And the inference of the model only takes a little bit longer than the one of the Llama model, which is also really cool. But I can tell in practice, uh, working with the Llama model still feels a little bit smoother. You have to wait less. Yeah, so we have great, impressive uh, inpainting results with the MAT model. It offers fast inference. The only downside of the model is that it only works with fixed size images of 512 times 512 resolution. But the tool that I will show you later will handle this in the background for you and it feels like seamless. You won't even feel that there are fixed size images required using the MAT model. The MAT model already achieves state-of-the-art results and common image inpainting benchmarks. So why would I show you another model? Well, <laughs> the stable diffusion model is not a traditional image inpainting model, but is rather the text-to-image synthesis model. So it generates images. And of course, since it can generate whole images, it is also able to just generate parts of images which are masked. And I said it already, it's a text-to-image synthesis model. And this means we, we not only can mask areas in an image and let the model in paint it, but we can also add text to it and tell the model how we would like the masked area to be in painted. And as the name of the stable diffusion model kind of gives it away, it's a diffusion model. And to cover like the whole theory behind diffusion models would take a whole new video. But uh, I want to broadly introduce the idea of diffusion models using this illustration. And there you can see that on the forward process, iteratively more and more noise is added to our input image. And the idea is to train a model that is able to take a noisy image and denoise it a little bit. So each step uh, our model learns to, to slightly denoise uh, an image. So if we repetitively do this, we, we are able to get from a completely noisy image to an image that we actually want. So this is what a denoise uh, diffusion model actually does by repetitively slightly denoising something that looks in the start like a completely noisy image to a less noisier image. We eventually end up getting an image that looks really impressive and realistic. I'm pretty sure you have already seen some examples of what the stable diffusion model is able to do. And overall, you can imagine this process maybe a little bit like how you would draw a picture. Usually you would first start with the semantics, like where would you put like, if you draw a human, like the legs, the arms, the head, and then 
later you would then start to add like details, hairs, uh, maybe eye color. And this also a little bit like the, how the diffusion process works. So we don't draw a picture like at once, but we iteratively get to our final result. But this is, <laughs> yeah, very broad or like uh, easy introduction. And um, if you want to learn more about it, write me a comment below. And then I would also do a more extensive video about diffusion models and how they work. Maybe we could look into how we can code as a small example. Okay, but back to the illustration. We can see that we start with something that looks like a completely noisy image, diffuse it, and then have a realistic image at the end. And since we start with something that's almost like completely noisy image, literally any outcome would be possible because we iteratively denoise it a little bit, but there is no guidance involved in it. And to change this, we can feed additional information to the model to add something that guides the denoising process and leads to an image that we actually would like. And this is also called conditioning. So the stable diffusion uh, text to image model would be a text conditioned diffusion model. But since we are interested in inpainting masked areas of an image, not only we add text as a guidance to our diffusion model, but we also add the mask as a additional information to the diffusion model. So that we end up that our text and our mask are getting concatenated so that they're our condition to guide our model in a way that our masked area gets inpainted with what we described in the text prompt. However, since we just condition the denoising process or guide the denoising process with our masked area and the text form, it is still possible that other parts outside the masked areas are also getting inpainted or edited, altered a little bit during the denoising process. So this would be one of the downsides of using the stable diffusion model. Now let's summarize the stable diffusion model and look at the pros and cons of the model. So one benefit are the impressive inpainting results the stable diffusion model is able to generate. What they revealed in their paper, they did a survey and based on human feedback, the stable diffusion model is able to generate better inpainting results than the LAMA model. The MAT model wasn't considered in that survey because it wasn't published during that time. And also we can add text prompts to even guide the inpainting. So we can tell the model how certain masked areas should be inpainted. We, we are also, instead of just removing objects, we would be able to even add objects in certain areas. So <laughs> basically you could add something in the background and the cons of the model are that possibly also areas outside the masked area are getting inpainted by the model. And another uh, downside is the slow inference, which is caused by the autoregressive denoising process. So because we have to uh, do it like step by step by step, the denoising process, which takes some time to calculate. Okay, but that's that are our three models for, for this video. And now let's move over to the practical part of the video. Let's go. Okay, now let's get our hands dirty. Let's start inpainting our first images. And I know a few of you now will get scared if they see any kind of code in the background. And I promise you, just bear with me. Just <laughs> do this few steps. I promise you, everybody of you can do it. It's super easy and it just takes maybe one minute. We have to sign up to one provider, but after that it takes one minute and then you can impaint your models and it will be super straightforward. So it's really no coding. I will show it to you. It will be super easy. Don't hesitate or don't uh, leave us because um, yeah, that's definitely a doable thing. Now we will start. And the first step is I hope you have a Google account because then you can open this color notebook. I will link it in the description section. So you just open this link and then you will see this page. You can either copy the notebook or just start executing and Google will ask you if you will copy your own one. And either you type shift plus enter or you just press this button to run the first cell. And now you maybe potentially some of you uh, executed their first line of code or shell command. And yeah, what this does is we install necessary packages that we will need. Uh, the one thing is our tool that we will use is the Llama Cleaner. It's based uh, on yeah, one of the models that I explained earlier in the theory section. And this one we will need because it's a like, remote session that we have on the Google Cloud server. And to 
since we will run a web app uh, locally in this environment, we will make it accessible through a tunnel. And for this, we need uh, ng-rock. And in the meantime, you can also already sign up there. <laughs> I promise I don't get paid by them, but it's just a nice way to tunnel your local session on the Google Cloud platform to make it available for you through the internet. And so either uh, if you already have an account, just log in, or if you don't have one, just sign up here. And yeah, I already uh, have mine, so I'm already logged in, but I can show you how it looks like if you if you don't have one. So, so you know, they just ask for your name, email, password, sign up, and then you'll see what I saw right now. Um, yes, and what, the only thing that we need to do is here, get to your auth token, copy this one. <laughs> I'm like, you can try copy mine and uh, type it in and yours. But after I'm done editing this video, I will reset my auth token. So yeah, you have to get your own one. <laughs> and what we will do next is then take that auth token, paste it here. And you see in the meantime, uh, the f execution of the first cell was successful. So now we can run our second cell. And what this does is creating a tunnel for us. So uh, yeah, the tunnel that I <laughs> mentioned earlier, so that our web app will be available through the internet and via this link that we have here. And no, the only thing that's left, we will start our Llama Cleaner server Llama Cleaner is the tool that we will use. And you can decide between a few models. Like those are all the models that I explained in the theory section, the Llama, MAT, and Stable Diffusion model. They're two different versions. Um, I just work with the ST2 one, but uh, maybe if you feel free also to use the older one. And for the initial model, because it's the most lightweight model, I would just use the Llama one, but don't worry. We can still change them later in the tool. So I ran command shift here, and now this is all the coding or all the execution of cells that we needed to do. And basically once we see this comment, which means that our web app is locally running, then we can open this link and access the tool and start impending pictures. So this just takes a few seconds to load the model weights. This is like the first AI model that we we'll use for embedding pictures. And okay, and now we can see that our web app is running and I will just click on this link. And um, yeah, I think then ngRock will ask us if it's a safe tunnel that we're <laughs> basically entering. And since, yeah, I created this one, uh, it's safe. So you can just click on visit site. I get this at the first try, I don't know, maybe you will have the same issue. I just reload the page then, and then everything looks like uh, how it's supposed to be. And from here, just take the picture that you, that you would like to in-paint, or uh, where you would like to remove people in the background. Uh, so I will just take this one, for example. And now we can zoom in by panning and finding basically people like I had this picture and I found like, you know, it would be way better if just the nature would be visible. So you can basically take the brush, you can adjust the size. And um, then let's go for this person. Just mask that area in the picture that you would like to alter in paint and release. And all the magic is happening in the background. So as I promised, it's super easy. Just have to wait a little bit. The Llama model is, by the way, the easiest of the three or the lightweightest. So the inference, the impending will be the fastest, even though you can see it takes a little bit. And et voila, there's the result. I think it's pretty impressive. So you really can't see anymore that there was a shadow or a person. Yes, and let's continue this for those two as well. Yeah, just skip the loading time to make the video shorter. And now I will also mask the third person. And those two, I will also 
yeah. Yes, and here's the final result. Isn't that crazy? I don't know if somebody tracked. It maybe took me one, two minutes, and I think it's yeah, pretty good result, you know, especially if you zoom out. Who would have guessed that before people were standing in this image? I was like, first time I was really like mind blown how easy it is to use those models and how good the results are. And I will also show you some other pictures. So uh, in the theory t uh, section, besides the Llama model, which is the fastest, I also show two other models that are actually uh, generating even better in painting results. But since I think it would be a little bit boring for you watching me changing the model, masking the persons again and again for each model. So what I actually did is I downloaded the mask that I draw. So by activating this toggle and then you can just download your in-painted image. <laughs> Overall, that's a good feature to know because that's what you came here for. So download your image once you're happy with the result using this button. Um, but what I also got is um, the, the mask, which looks like this one. And afterwards, what I could also do is uploading this again with a, a person inside the picture. And then I uploaded the mask again. And by doing this, you can see it already loads. So I know the whole area is already masked and I don't have to individually draw those uh, masks for the persons. And as you can see, I'm getting the same result. Pretty impressive. And uh, this way I compared those three models to make it a... Uh, I, I saw I went in the, into the background. Sorry for that. Yeah, this way I could have a fair comparison of the results for the three models. For the stable diffusion model, I just used as a text from background. I will just show you now the, the results of all three models that I had on a couple of pictures and let's talk about them and then I will show you how I, um, how I actually generated the one uh, for the thumbnail of this video because I think that was the most impressive one. Okay, but now let's first look into the uh, couple of comparisons that I created. Yeah, I just visualized them already and here we can see I had a couple of people standing here in the foreground. Uh, don't worry, I yeah, for privacy reasons, I added a circle in their in their face so nobody can recognize them. And here we have the llama model, and clearly you can tell with the color difference that this doesn't look like super realistic. Mm, the same with the MAT model. Here we can even see that the whole texture is a little bit like bended. <laughs> Which also doesn't like super realistic. It's still impressive that it's like I'm like here the uh, shape is maintained, which is cool. Also of this building, so overall that looks quite nice. Yeah, and I think the best result. The only thing is like uh, here, it's like a little bit like pixel cr crushing. I don't know. This looks a little bit smoother, but here the color is a little bit the issue. Here the color looks pretty good, uh, but but you can see that it doesn't look really smooth. So overall, I think since so much of this building was covered by the persons, the all three models kind of failed really retaining it and the uh, shape. And if you look closely, theoretically it's like a symmetric building. So we, have, we would have the information here, but yeah, I think right now models are not able to uh, figure that out. And I mean, like it's a very challenging task. So the next picture is a little bit easier. I just had a couple of people here in the background and I found all three models provided good results. Right now it's also very uh, hard to see that. Maybe this way it's a little bit easier, but this looks perfectly realistic to me. Uh, same this one. I mean, like this looks a little bit off. I don't know <laughs> why there will be like a, this, like the surrounding. Uh, this highlights a little bit too much from uh, my perspective. And this one looks also pretty perfect. Uh, nobody would have guessed that this is not realistic, I would say. Here, this one we saw already. We removed them with the llama model. Here you could see I, I drew the mass a little bit different. And for some reason, we had this one here, which also happened to the MAT model here. But the stable diffusion model was able to kind of figure out that the way is ending here. So that's, yeah, out of those three, under these circumstances, I like this one the most, but if you look at this one, yeah, also with the llama model, it was pretty perfect. So I think sometimes it also varies a little bit how you draw the mask. And yeah, from my own experience, like sometimes 
trying the same uh, trying to in paint the same picture multiple times can really help because you get different results each time and then the last picture which i also had in a thumbnail it's the most difficult one <laughs> because you have so many individual persons also the reflections on the water in front of the Taj Mahal i guess many of you know that building <laughs> and here we have the llama model and yeah you can see in the artifact that this overall doesn't look realistic anymore. People would immediately see that something is wrong, but the same for both other images. Here it looks even a little bit worse, I would say. And yeah, this here you can see a little bit the surroundings of the persons, but actually I like a little bit that uh, the building at least is retained. Also the reflection looks better. This is still maintained, which is cool. I like this. That's cool that this is maintained. I like it's also in those two. But here you can definitely see in the water a little bit of difference that looks the best out of those three. And I would say like the building also looks a little bit better. So I think overall uh, with a stable diffusion model you will get the best results with end painting, but it's also the slowest. So what I often did is just starting with the llama model. And if I couldn't get better results and I wasn't happy, then I uh, moved on to the stable diffusion and even though on benchmarks the MAT model performs better than the LAMA model I felt in practice it is a little bit slower and for me when I reached the limits of the LAMA model and tried the MAT model I never got like really better results and more like had similar issues with the MAT model as well so actually primarily I just used the llama model and stable diffusion model when I was in painting my pictures. But all of them look a little bit different than the thumbnail and maybe you're wondering now was that a fake or no? No actually um, I just wrote one mask for this one and I said in the theory section that with the stable diffusion model we can also add text prompts to alter the in painting and that's what I did and then I got better results. So those two models we can't pass text to the model to influence how the masks get in painted but with the stable diffusion model we have this power and yeah let's move on to this and now I'll show you how I did actually the thumbnail. Okay and for this now let's first upload the picture and yeah just by drag and drop yeah, exactly now we have the image here and I also have the mask for this one so I will just upload the mask and now we can see that it immediately tries to in paint this model this is the result of, of the llama model and now we will open the settings and choose a different model and here we will just choose the SD2 which is the stable diffusion 2 model and what will happen now we will get yeah prompted that it's switching to the stable diffusion 2 model you might thinking why does it take so long this is in the background we will be loading the model weights and that could be another advantage of using google cola because you can see it has way higher yeah download rates than i would have at home with 100 megabytes uh, per second and yeah but it takes a little bit and Maybe let's have a look at the settings that we have. Steps are the denoising steps. So in general, if you want to get your results faster, reduce the steps, but often you will have less qualitative results. So they, they look a little bit worse, but um, oh, this was successful now, perfect. And I see I'm in the background again. <laughs> if you increase them, your results will get better the more steps you have. Uh, but it's not like, you know, if you have thousand steps, you will get the best. Usually I, often used like 40 to 50. The guidance scale um, kind of forces the model, the higher the scale is, the more the model will in paint that mask in accordance to your text prompt. So the less the guidance scale is, the more creative can the model be. And the, the higher the guidance scale is, the less creative it is and the more it is bound or strict to your text prompt. Okay, just uh, a few parameters that I work with and now let's try to do this again with the SD2 model, a stable diffusion 2 model. And for this I added background and that was basically for me the difference adding Taj Mahal as an additional information. And now let's see what the stable diffusion model will output us. What I mentioned earlier, this model has the slowest inference which means it takes the longest to in-paint the picture with it. 
we can see the track here. So each of this denoising step and I tried to run this locally on my computer and I could tell you after two minutes I didn't finish a single step. So this is definitely when the GPUs come into place and show their real potential. I found the Llama model actually also worked on my local computer, but the stable diffusion model I definitely needed a GPU for. Yeah, and here you can see the result when I added Taj Mahal in the text prompt. And if you compare it to the one we had earlier, you can clearly see that this looks way better than the one before if I just added background as a text prompt. So guiding or giving the sta stable diffusion more information can definitely help in certain circumstances to make the picture look more realistic. I was pretty amazed how the digital level is here because this looks pretty cool. But I wasn't done here because if you zoom in, you can still see the shapes of the people. And what I then did with the Stable Diffusion 2 model, you can also add a negative prompt. So what definitely shouldn't be in the picture. And for, her, for this, I added people as a negative prompt and ran it again. And after adding the people negative prompt, you can see the people actually got removed. So if we zoom in here, you barely can see them anymore. It's very hard. So <laughs> I think the stable diffusion model is definitely the most powerful one, even though it's also the trickiest one because you have to explore a lot and try different text prompts that could help. But the results, if you look at this, pretty amazing. I was really like, I think it's so cool that this is possible. And what I then did to even further optimize it, I went back to the Llama model because it's just faster in the inference. And then I cleaned it just a little bit. For example, this thing I just removed because I had the experience if you use the Llama model in areas where the surrounding has a certain color and you basically just want to fill it. You could also do it in Photoshop, but I often just use the Llama model to clean or to fit the certain pixels to the environment. For example, this area. Now I hope that we have a clear edge with a red here and the marble color in the upper area. And yeah, there you can see it did exactly what I wanted to and it is fast. So that's why I, in the end, used the Llama model to even make it a little bit cleaner, the whole picture, and to yeah optimize it a little bit. Yes, and I could even go further and optimize a little bit more, but you can see how I've worked this way. And I think it's crazy how this model can optimize or change your pictures. What do you think, guys? Are you as surprised as I am? Or do you think like that's, that's not cool at all? Let me know in the comments what you think about these techniques. Also, what your results are, if you have different experience with the different models, or uh, if you have questions to it, just ask in the comments below. And yeah, I think I gave you all the tools, how to do it, how to use it. Now it's time to get creative. I hope you will get the results that you want to have. And I can't wait to maybe see some. Please feel free to share them in the comments. I would be keen to see yours. And maybe you have also some tips for me. Just share them in the comments because maybe there are some prompt engineers here who know how to get even better results if you use the uh, text prompts for the stable diffusion model. So feel free to share also that. I'm very happy to learn new stuff. And yeah, that's it for the practical part of this video. All right, guys, and that's it for today's video. I, it definitely turned out to be my longest video on YouTube, but I hope it will really help you creating awesome, amazing in-painting results with those awesome AI models that I showed you. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. That would be really cool. I really appreciate that. And right now only 4% of my watch time is from subscribers. So feel free to subscribe to my channel if you like my videos. That will really help me growing this channel and creating more videos. And yeah, have a good time and see you in the next video. Bye bye.